And this evening, Professor Gordon is going to share some of the challenges that translators like him face when making the Bible available to ordinary people like me. We look forward then to hearing something of these insights this evening, Professor Gordon, and thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome Professor Robert Gordon. How wise to have the applause at the beginning <laughs> while the audience is still awake, and so to the business of tonight. Uh, the King, King James translation of the Bible is truly a monument, and there's no disputing that, whatever else I say this evening. A monument, a colossus in the history of religion, literature, and more generally, in this country, if I must still speak, uh, of the uh, United Kingdom as a unit, and in the English-speaking world, and indeed beyond that, because of the influence it has exercised on writing, translation, and so on, even in other languages. It's fair to say that quite a lot of that merit belongs to the original text itself. Sometimes that is forgotten. We hear such lovely expressions that are King James expressions. Actually, if you render fairly literally from the Bible languages, you will end up with some of those expressions. So it's good to keep that in mind that there is a hinterland of Bible text that has wonderful merit attaching to it. And of course, there were predecessors like William Tyndale more of him anon, and we all know about that, I'm sure, or most of us do. The tremendous use that was made of Tyndall's Bible translation efforts by the King James translators. The version has been highly successful, influential, far-reaching, and again, part of the explanation of that is that God's people would not let him use any other version. <laughs> These are sort of conditioning elements as we sing the praises of King James's men. For many centuries, the Bible was preserved in scrolls and codices. But then came the printing press in the 15th century. And as was noted by Elizabeth Eisenstein way back in 1979, the printing press had far-reaching effects socially, intellectually, right across the world, and this applied as much as anything to the Bible. The study and dissemination of the Bible were transformed as a result. And one of the things that became possible with the printing press, arrival of, was the establishing of a standard text, something fixed, stable, in a way that had not really existed before and certainly not in English. You've only to recall the looseness with which names and spellings generally were handled in older English and Middle English and early modern English. Uh, there's such flux and fluidity in the spellings of words. People just didn't think in the way that we used to about spelling in our country until modern improvements in our education. And it was not until 1769, to pluck one of a number of possible dates, and the publication of Benjamin Blaney's edition of the KJV, the King James Version, that there was a reasonably settled uh, text of that translation, roughly comparable with what we know. Blaney was continuing a process of correction and improvement that was necessary right from the word go in 1611. It wasn't just spellings, there were errors like uh, the omission of the not unimportant little word not, you know, in Ezekiel 24 poured it upon the ground, or poured it not upon the ground. It makes a difference. Uh, by comparison, uh, reading lamb instead of ram in number 6, verse 14, was a, a, a small error. Calculations of the numbers of corrections between 1611 and 1769 vary wildly, and I wouldn't 
attempt this evening uh, to give you a figure. They depend partly on the viewpoint of the people reporting. What were they counting? Errors, uh, spelling differences, audible differences in spelling. You end up with quite different figures depending. Some people would actually point to the so-called pure Cambridge edition of about 1900 as the canonical form of the King James Version. And even nowadays, you may well know that there are words there like public and music spelt with final Ks, such as we don't really do in our day and age. And there's that beautiful kneesings of Leviathan in Job chapter 41. Kneesings, which is an older form of sneezing. I think if I had the choice, I'd rather be kneesed upon somehow, uh, thinking onomatopoeically. But uh, kneesings is still there. You can see it for yourself. So, Somewhat in contrast, during this period of gradual standardization of the text, there was a growing awareness, too, of the existence of many, many manuscripts of the New Testament in particular. At the time of the King James, how many did they use? How many did they know to produce their New Testament translation? A dozen, two dozen, something like that at the most? No two of the texts agreed perfectly. But as time went by, more and more, hundreds in fact, until we now are in the region of well into the sixth millennium, 5,000 and something, uh, manuscripts of the New Testament are available. As that awareness increased, of course, that's working in the opposite direction, isn't it, from standardization? That's saying we can't put it all together in a form that everybody can accept and agree upon. And we want to keep an eye on that. But it wasn't just spelling that got the King James Version into trouble in the early days. Who hasn't heard, it's a rhetorical question, uh, of the judgment of Hugh Broughton, the choleric and controversial Hugh Broughton, uh, who commented on the new version the King James. He was writing to someone who had the king's ear. And he said, the late Bible, right worshipful, was sent to me to, he uses a word meaning assess, which bred in me a sadness that will grieve me while I breathe. He died the next year, by the way. It is so ill done. Tell his majesty that I had rather be rent in pieces with wild horses than any such translation by my consent should be urged upon poor churches. You've heard the bit, I'm sure, about the wild horses. It's forever being quoted. So plus a change. The more things change, the more it's the same. Bible translations being complained about. They were never welcome. They're not today, eh, as far as many people are concerned. The year before 1611, Broughton had written to King James to protest against the whole King James project and offering his assistance. The big error was, of course, that he had not been included uh, among all those translators, 50-odd translators contributing to KJV. Very interesting what he said. He said, the translators are incapable of handling the Hebraeo-Hellenic apostles. What on earth is that about? <laughs> there are scarcely two people in the world who can manage such a task. He himself was one of the scarcely two. <laughs> I was sitting at lunch recently in uh, Trinity College in Cambridge. It was a Sunday. Uh, Ruth was unwell, and she suggested that rather than suffer my own <coughs> cooking, I should perhaps just go into college and have lunch, which I can do any day of the week. Uh, so I did go in, and I was sitting opposite a young lady, I heard her talk about the difficulties in getting a Hebrew a fonts correctly represented. And uh, when I joined in later, I discovered she was researching on Broughton. And uh, that led me to some very interesting material. Kirsten McFarlane is her name. And uh, 
she is doing some quite fundamental research on this part of the background to KJV. The Hebreo-Hellenic Apostles bit refers to the fact that Broughton is concerned that the King James uh, translators don't know about the Jewish background of the New Testament. This is something that's become a live issue and theme recurrently now, so much so that I suppose nowadays people like Bruce Winter and others are trying to get us back and rightly also into the classical world, remembering to whom Paul wrote and against what background he himself was serving in the Mediterranean area. So they didn't understand that there were all these Jewish expressions and practices and so on that bubble up sometimes in the New Testament text and KJV, the King James Version, the immaculate, perfect King James was flawed right from the start. Uh, Broughton, when the volume actually appeared, uh, published, of course, his review and listed the types of errors under 10 main headings. And he said, this thing is urgently in need of correction. A few of the early printings of King James, of course, added notoriously to its difficulties. Here's another rhetorical question. Who has not heard of the Wicked Bible of 1631? That's a rhetorical question. Don't raise your hand. But that's the one that left out the little word not and produced a text which said, thou shalt commit adultery. And uh, there's another deliberate looking uh, error in that one in Deuteronomy 5 that I shall not mention tonight in relation to God. It, it was highly irreverent if it was intentional, unfortunate if it was not. And right on through the decades in the 17th century and into the 18th century, people were complaining about the King James Version. The more I read about it, the more I get dispirited because I picked out two or three illustrations, then found I could have 25 more that are quite on the surface of some of the popular books on the subject. Uh, in 1643, that's 30 odd years afterwards, and 1645, in sermons preached in the House of Commons, uh, John Lightfoot, an outstanding Hebrew scholar, called for a revision of King James. Uh, one of the things he wanted was the omission of the Apocrypha. Um, some people don't realize that uh, it included originally the Apocrypha. In 1657, Parliament approved a subcommittee that would make recommendations for revision, but nothing came of that. A couple of years later, Robert Gell wrote his long essay with a long title, an essay toward the amendment of the last English translation of the Bible, or approved by many instances, and so on. Let him go off into a field and finish it there. Um, and he too argued that King James should be revised. And he says, and though I think our last translation good, yet I doubt not that ours may be made much better than it is. Doubt everywhere. Ingratitude abounds. The specialist on English Bible history, David Norton, sums up the reception history of the King James in the bold assertion that it was generally scorned or ignored as English writing for a century and a half after its publication. A favourite of mine is Robert Louth, uh, who was the professor of poetry at Oxford in the uh, later 18th century, Robert Louth, L-O-W-T-H. He was the one who popularised the idea that a good proportion of the prophets is written in poetry. And that's why your modern translations set out uh, much of Isaiah and the rest in poetic form. There were hints of that previously, but it was Louth got it going. And uh, he had a fine grasp of English, indeed he published an English grammar, uh, and, and such a fine scholar. He was professor of poetry, as I said, Oxford, then Bishop of Oxford, uh, Bishop of London, and almost Archbishop of Canterbury, except that I think he was just feeling too old and too uh, ill to take on that onerous responsibility. At different points in his sermons and in his commentary on Isaiah, he talks about the need for the Bible to be set forth in a more advantageous and just light. He says the necessary work of making a completely new translation 
must be undertaken for the use of our church. And of course, he was very conscious of the fact that King James, apart from other things, fell down on this business of the poetic nature of so much in the Old Testament. Even the revised version of 1881, Old Testament 1885, didn't get round to accepting that there was so much poetry in the prophets. John Wesley got in on the act in the middle of the 18th century. He published his own sort of revision with 12,000 changes in his New Testament text, mostly clarificatory, simplifying, straightening out, all that sort of thing. But there again, evidence of unease with KJV. Other efforts included that of John Nelson Darby. Darby is, of course, associated with translations of the Bible into German and French, though those were done strictly with native speakers from fellowships that he had established in Switzerland, Germany, and France from the 1830s onwards. He was a great man, great linguist, great Bible scholar, but his involvement in those translations was uh, more collaborative uh, than as single translator. The Elberfelder Bibel is still very much alive. I have a copy uh, at home in a modern Brockhaus edition. He didn't uh, produce a, a translation of the whole Bible, in fact, into English either. Uh, in 1867, he, again, it's the long title, isn't it? Well, it provides you with the first uh, paragraph of your essay. The Gospels, Acts, Epistles, and the Book of Revelation, commonly called the New Testament, a new translation from a revised text of the Greek original. Um, he should have got Alan or somebody to improve on the title, like what happened there tonight and got you along here under false pretenses. <laughs> the translation of the Old Testament that goes by his name was actually created by associates on the basis of the French and German translations uh, and was joined with the New Testament to form the Moorish 1890, the Holy Scriptures, a new translation from the original languages. It's interesting to look at Darby from the point of view of the manuscripts, the Bible text that he was using or that he accepted, acknowledged as the basis for his translation work. We have this thing associated with the King James, and you're just going to have to swallow this uh, this, this evening, um, this thing called the Textus Receptus, or the received text, which basically means that there were those few manuscripts available in the early 17th century for the translators. Uh, later, generation later, uh, that grouping was dignified with the title Received Text. The number of manuscripts belonging in the larger, much larger Byzantine family, accounting for 95% of all New Testament uh, manuscripts, those came later. So it, it's a little bit complicated, and uh, as you recite the mere facts, you become more and more puzzled that some people could be actually so behold and attached and committed to the so-called received text. But I think I dipped my toe in controversy there for long <laughs> enough. Darby was already saying that old TR, as people are beginning to talk about it, that is insufficient. There is other evidence. There is earlier evidence. And so that creeps into his choices of readings as he works his way through the text and manuscripts of the New Testament. In the uh, 1884 edition of the New Testament, published two years after his death, there is quite a bit of talk about this issue too. And a very guarded acceptance of something beyond the Textus Receptus, something that took account of later evidence and said, This truly helps us to get back nearer the original word given to the apostles and others. I was interested in reading again some of Darby's own introductory comments recently uh, to see his views on three old chestnuts that I'll just mention very quickly. First one, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, you know that one? Is it God was manifest in flesh or 
he was manifest in flesh. Uh, it's one of those bellwether texts, isn't it? And if you say he, you are supposed to be unsigned or something like that. I suspect that uh, it's he because it's a quotation. I sometimes have compared this with Wesley uh, and one of his hymns. You know, if you are talking about the Lord Jesus, you don't always use the title as you progress, do you? You might start a hymn verse with, he breaks the power of cancelled sin, he sets the prisoner free, and you wouldn't accuse him of, that is Wesley, of being heretical, would you? And that's probably what has happened in this text in Timothy. The better reading seems to be he. And by saying that, I am not derogating nor daring to derogate from the perfect, full deity of the Lord Jesus. I'm just making a judgment about Bible texts and readings. But listen to Darby. What does he do? He translates God was manifest, or slightly different wording for the verb. And then he says in his footnote, I do not enter on the criticism of this text. It should very likely read, he who has been, he. But he put in his translation, God. You see the kind of pressure of conformity that affected even Darby. And that is a nasty and bad and negative thing in the history of Bible translation that there are people, I call them the hard men from James, who very often obscure and restrict and cause harm because they have their own fixed dogmatic view of what is allowable and what is not and it interferes with sound judgment. And here is a case of Darby, no less, saying I think on balance, it's he was manifest in flesh, the Lord Jesus, but he puts in the translation, God was. The other two texts um, are in relation to the ending of Mark's Gospel and the section on the woman taken in adultery in John chapter 7 through to 8. I'm not going to pursue those because I'm suddenly becoming aware of the clock. Darby's translation, as Professor Bruce notes, was consulted by the team responsible for the revised version of 1881, partly because of the text critical notes, such as I've just mentioned, and the philological notes talking about the meanings of words in the biblical text. There's another name also associated with Plymouth I must just mention and pass on, and that's Samuel S.P. Tregellis, a great scholar too, and a very interesting story there is attaching to his name. He was invited to join the Revised Version New Testament team. Uh, he accepted, but he was unable to be present at meetings because of the onset of illness. A failing eyesight is one explanation that I have read. As a kind of footnote to this, uh, perhaps I should say that as far as I'm aware, Professor Bruce himself, the greatest of all, uh, certainly in the 20th century, was not uh, involved as a panel member in any of the translation ventures of which there's been several and many in the later 20th century. Of course, he did produce his own uh, expanded paraphrase of Paul's epistles. He was a great lover of Paul, wasn't Fred Bruce? And Tim Grass, your uh, lecturer two years ago, tells us in his biography of FFB that in the last two years of his life, he gave considerable assistance to Kenneth Taylor as he revised the Living Bible into what became the New Living Translation. That certainly was deserving of help, that Living Bible. <laughs> I'll not tell you a personal story about that one. The Schofield Reference Bible open your ears perhaps, 1917 and subsequent, um, was uh, of course one way in which Darby's teaching was popularized. It wasn't itself a new translation, but it became a vehicle by which uh, Darby's teaching became so much better known. The notes in Schofield, for some people, have a kind of quasi-biblical authority attaching to them, and well, there are those who disagree, disagree.
They combine information and misinformation in confusing amounts. They present highly contested interpretations, such as the introduction of the old world catastrophe in Genesis 1 and 2. They use headings and lots of subheadings uh, directing your reading so that you know how you should read the Bible. You're not allowed that unless you are reading Schofield. If you're a Catholic or someone else, you're benighted for having exactly the same sort of thing. And, uh, of course, there's the dispensational division of Scripture, where, interestingly, he squeezes four of his several uh, dispensations into Genesis 1, 1 to Exodus 19, verse 8. Obviously a very busy period dispensationally in the history of the world. All that owes very much to Darby, but that debt is unacknowledged. It's interesting uh, just to pause over that kind of thing. Darby himself was quite indebted to Edward Irving and to the Albury uh, Conference Group. I don't think he mentions that much at all, if at all. I know he does talk sometimes about God giving him insights into Scripture himself. So there's a bit of ping-pong here of uh, failure to acknowledge sources and influence. It's a further irony that the Reverend Schofield should be chosen by God to popularize Darby's scheme, since Darby had written against clerisy as the sin against the Holy Ghost in this dispensation. I don't know whether that's divine humor or what it is that puts these people together in this kind of way, but uh, it makes you wonder. I think I'll pass over the rest of Schofield and try to remain half friends with some of you. <laughs> we would perhaps be better employed to think for a moment of the recurrence of this history of, I suppose it's the three hours you could have re rendering, that's translation, resistance and uh, revision. In other words, improving the original against which people have uh, stirred up resistance. There's a much older translation of the Old Testament with which King James compares in a number of different ways. That's the Septuagint. You know that one, the Greek translation of the Old Testament made in the second and first centuries before Christ. Uh, that's the version that really was good enough for St. Paul. Um, and that raises a question or two. But that one, you know, people have told me so many times over the years that, about the King James and that joke, you know, that is good enough for St. Paul. I've heard it so many times. I really ought to charge for listening to it. Um, but actually, the Septuagint was the translation uh, that was good enough for Paul. And he and his associates mostly quote from it in the New Testament. Legends grew up round the Septuagint. You've probably heard how 70, or it might have been 72 translators, uh, paired off, did their work, and uh, when they came together, lo and behold, their texts were found to be in wondrous and perfect agreement. And the story rolled on like a snowball down through the several early Christian centuries until you come, for example, to the time of Augustine, who regarded the Septuagint in the Latin form that he knew it, the so-called Old Latin, as the authorized version of the day. And when the naughty and acerbic uh, Jerome, towards the end of the fourth century, decided to go back to the Greek and the Hebrew of the Bible text and translate from them into Latin, well, Augustine didn't think much of that. And I'll just pick one sentence out of uh, what I have in front of me here because this is the kind of thing you hear occasionally. For my own part, I cannot sufficiently express my wonder that anything should at this date be found in the Hebrew manuscripts which escaped so many translators perfectly acquainted with the language. In other words, you're wasting your time. We knew it all already. How many times has that been implied uh, in connection with our English Bible translation history? Now, Jerome knew what was coming. And he wrote a prologue to his translation enterprise. It's uh, prefacing his translation of First and Second Samuel. It's called his Prologus Galeatus. And you all talk about it here, I'm sure uh, you, you do. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, his helmeted, his helmeted prologue. He was putting a helmet on to protect himself from two-legged asses, that's people like you and me, and barking dogs who opposed his translation venture. Do you get the flavor that translation is never welcome, very seldom? 
especially if it's a major new impulse. Uh, Augustine did conceive that, uh, conceived that Jerome's Vulgate could be useful, but he held that it would be better not read in public in case pious people were upset. So there you go. And you come forward again to 1611 and just before it, and the King James translators were themselves uh, expecting this kind of treatment. His Majesty, King James, oh, that man who was, what, was he brighter than the sun and all that, the terrible stuff they, they addressed to him. Anyway, he knew full well that whosoever attempted anything for the public, especially if it appertained to religion and to the opening and clearing of the word of God, the same setteth himself upon a stage to be glouted upon. Uh, people stopped glouting in the 19th century, but it, they weren't very friendly looks at such people as were being glouted upon. To be glouted upon by every evil eye. Yea, he casteth himself headlong upon pikes to be gored by every sharp tongue. And so it was with the revised version a good while later when it came out. The, the revisers had to work with operational guidelines that were very restrictive. Uh, they had to make as few changes as possible, and the changes that they did make were to preserve the language and try to imitate the language of the King James Version. There's a lovely story told about William Wright, uh, who was born in Scotland and a, a very distinguished Semitist in the Semitic language, as that is. He had a white parrot as a pet, a truly eccentric member of the family, uh, what you would say nowadays, a parrot with attitude. Sir Wallace Budge, the Egyptologist, uh, recalled uh, attending a, a dinner party in the Wright household one evening. The parrot was very jolly, and uh, a handkerchief had to be put over its cage to quieten him down. But during a, a pause in the conversation, the parrot was heard to call down damnation on the minor prophets. I will leave you to recreate the exact sentence because it's better thought of than expressed. And that was in a tone awfully like that of his owner. <laughs> Wright explained to his friends when they stopped laughing that the parrot must have learned this from the young man who worked in the garden. But it was very ungallant. In fact, Wright was having a frustrating time working on the minor prophets for the revised version with these restrictions. Keep to the language of the AV, make as few changes as possible, and yet get the thing correct. The actual publication was greeted by an, another Hugh Brought, and this time Dean Bergen, who uh, regarded the thing as a failure at all levels. I would like to quote from him, but I do not have the time. And 50 years later, when the Times ran a kind of celebratory uh, uh, column on the revised version, as you did in those days, Bibles were big things, even in 1935, um, they praised the, the Old Testament translators, but the New Testament people got it in the neck. They included no men of letters versed in the rhythm, cadence, and euphony of good English. They set themselves a pedantic code, and they cheerfully ruined many of the loveliest passages in English literature. Revised version adherents here will probably not recognize that description. I don't myself particularly. There's a lovely um, sketch, it's a, a jeu d'esprit. I first came across reference to it in one of Professor Bruce's writings. It's called, and I, I delight in the title, Babylon Bruised and Mount Moriah Mended. It was published by two Cambridge Dons in 1940. What did you do in the war, Daddy? That kind of thing. Um, they imagined a, a return visit by Cromwell's men, you know, the iconoclasts, to Cambridge, to uh, colleges, chapels, churches, as they'd done around 1643 with some evidence in the village church where we live, in the parish church there, destroying anything that looked like an effigy, an image, and all that kind of thing. Um, and there's a piece in there that says, um, in the chapel at Ridley Hall, one of the Anglican theological colleges, we turned the lectern straight. In other words, we got away from the old high stuff and got the Word of God back uh, more central, we took away therefrom a superstitious book called the Revised Version and did put the Bible in place thereof. <laughs> nice, isn't it? I, I 
can't find that copy of Babylon Bruised anywhere. I, I suspect I lent it to a Christian, so it's not very hopeful. <laughs> this hermeneutic of suspicion continues down to our own day, or the day of most of us here, I think, or some of us at least here, and the welcoming of the Common Bible, 1973. Some of you might recall it. It was based on the Revised Standard Version. Well, Welcomed uh, by an Ulsterman, whose name I will not mention, uh, not to be too direct, as the Bible of the Antichrist. In fact, most attempts, I've said this already in effect, most attempts to render the scriptures more accurately or more intelligibly are misrepresented and defamed by someone or other. I'm going to summarize the next bit very drastically. But one thing I want to highlight is the part that concordances, Bible concordances, play in exalting the King James to the point where it is final form, more finalized indeed than even the biblical texts themselves, because the biblical te texts were being produced over centuries, weren't they? And by the time you had uh, an early Bible text from, say, the time of Samuel or whatever you want to choose, or Isaiah. Chronicles in the fourth century following on was a latecomer, and the copies of Isaiah or Samuel or whatever are likely to be having errors in transmission, every manuscript does while the new one from Chronicles is fresh and pristine. You see, there's a process there. And if you get a, a Bible text uh, that can be concordance... Well, let me tell you the story very briefly. In 1737, there's the Cruden's one, isn't there? And that, that, that was a good start. And, and then in the 19th century, uh, we have uh, Robert Young in 1879, uh, an excellent concordance. It's not comprehensive. Uh, but it's getting on in that direction, and it uh, introduces people to the underlying uh, biblical languages as well. Strong's Concordance in 1890 is remarkable. It really does catch the eye. He records virtually every occurrence of every biblical word in the body of his concordance, and then remarkably has an appendix of 47 other words which he simply uh, lists according to reference without the quotation. Why? Because they include the indefinite article a, or an, the, the definite article, prepositions like of, uh, and, and lots more, about a quarter of a million references. Amazing, isn't it? So helpful. If you can't remember that Bible verse, but you know that the is in it, you can go searching. <laughs> and. Um, take a bag of sweets or something with you and uh, stay at it. But you see, in 1890 in Strong's Concordance, you really have got to the point where the Bible text is so fixed and established in some people's minds, and not without some measure of uh, propriety, it's so fixed that you can actually list every occurrence of ah and an. And I can't develop this tonight, but you can see how that contributes to where we are and where some people in particular are in relation to their preference for Bible translations. Every word, right down to the indefinite article, is worthy of, list of listing. Concordancing had happened previously, and uh, if time had allowed, I would, like, would have liked to talk about the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, and how things like that were happening some centuries earlier, and so on and so forth, but there you are. Now, the story of King James, therefore, is one of an aging monarch trying to defend the realm, trying to fend off new aspirants to his throne. And every time that a new translation, however good and solid, has appeared, of course, some old arguments are again deployed against the new venture. I'm going to take, very briefly, five... Uh, where do you turn the lights out here, by the way? Um, I'm going to take five... Uh, I didn't hear that, maybe fortunately. 
I'm going to take five and just deal with them very summarily indeed. First of all, modern versions are based on inferior Greek texts. Well, since King James, since the early talk of the received text, of course, we've had the two fourth century codices, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, so important to Westcott and Hort in the later 19th century. We have well over a hundred papyri from the second century, mainly third, fourth, and a little bit later. But in fact, among that, uh, fragmentary but very important earlier evidence than the Textus Receptus give us. So, gives us. So the commonsensical view would be take all the evidence that you can find and make your best judgment in every single case. That's what sensible people do. That's what most New Testament scholars actually do. And I'm not going to say any more about that or I'll get nowhere indeed. Secondly, the King James is more reverent. Uh, perhaps it sounds so. Uh, a lot of that depends on the use of thou and thee and thine, doth it not? Right? <laughs> but as has been regularly pointed out, this usage makes the translation more holy than the original. In the original languages, there were no special pronouns for deity. It's simply because the singular is used, obviously, of God and individuals, divine and otherwise, that we get this old English, thou, thee, and thine. But there's something more interesting here. You'll get it, for example, in that fine book, Gordon Campbell's Bible, The Story of the King James Version, published in 2011. Thou, in those times, was actually a, a marker of social relationship rather than grammatical number. You can uh, Google and you'll get this information from one and another source. You was the def deferential term. And thou was the one you might well use when you're speaking down the way, the hoton ba. Yeah, the hoton ba. From above, downwards. And so in Twelfth Night, have you heard of Shakespeare? Yep. Uh, Sir Toby Belshaw advises Sir Andrew Egucheek on how to be rude to Viola, uh, also known as Cesario. Here's the quote. Taunt him with the license of ink. If thou thoust him some thrice, it shall not be amiss. In other words, make a fool of him, take him down, or her, take him down a peg by addressing him as thou. It's just the opposite of what a lot of people understand about thou in the period. There's also the case of Sir Walter Raleigh at his trial in 1603, uh, just before the Hampton Court uh, Conference of 1604 that produced the AV decision, all that Lord Cobham did, Cobham did was at thy instigation, thou viper, for I, thou, thee, thou traitor. I'm addressing you as thou because I want to vilify you. Now, the problem is, is more complex than that. The situation certainly would need a lot of fleshing out. But don't you see how that, that puts a kind of spoke in the wheel of anyone who's arguing that you are irreverent if you use you in your address to God and fail to use thou and thine? It's not as straightforward as has commonly been, I wouldn't say suggested so much as argued. Archaism, the use of old forms, is appropriate um, sometimes, or has been in antiquity. When some Hebrew scribes, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, you'll find this, when they were copying out the text in the more modern square script, when they came to the divine name, Jehovah, whatever form you use for it, they would use the old alphabet. Even in some Greek manuscripts, they would do that. They would use the old alphabet to indicate the divine name. Reverence is always appropriate. That's not in question, even when we say Abba. And incidentally, since I'm in Scotland, the great James Barr, who originated in Edinburgh, wrote an article in the Journal of Theological Studies quite some years ago now, the title of which was basically Abba isn't Daddy. That's a quite uh, wrong conception of the significance of Abba. 
as used in the New Testament. It does not mean so familiarly daddy, and we need to get that right. But as far as thou and you are concerned, each should be persuaded in their own mind. The King James is supposed to be the touchstone of sound doctrine. Don Carson in the 1970s published a, a book which um, looked at the eight debated texts that he chose anyway on the deity of Christ. It was very interesting. Uh, he scored them according to whether they had an orthodox uh, rendering or something else. And here I'll give you some of the scores. King James, Revised Standard Version, and New English Bible all score four out of eight. The Revised Version, six out of eight. NIV, seven out of eight. Now that says nothing about accuracy. But what it does say is that sometimes modern translations are actually more orthodox, sound, if you like, sounding. You know what I mean by sound sounding? Actually more sound sounding than the good old King James. So it is a slander against modern translations in general to say that they are soft or weak on this sort of thing. I'm interested in how, for example, the uh, New English Bible in Hebrews chapter 1. The New English Bible, which would not be regarded as coming from an orthodox stable particularly, would it? But it actually there, because the translators thought so, and I think they were wrong personally, but who am I? They, they actually invented a, a, another text in support of the deity of Christ uh, in verse 9. They say, instead of King James, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. They say, therefore, O God, thy God has set thee above thy fellows. They've actually, by using the vocative in address to Jesus, created a text, created a text that others don't recognize in general, in recognition of the deity of Christ. How's that for heresy? I must pass over that. King James is lauded for its stateliness of language. There's something in that. But it's fair to say that the translation is sometimes stately sounding when the original underlying it is actually rather pedestrian. I'll not illustrate that right here and now. And sometimes it's, at it's most stately when it's unintelligible. So this is hardly a, a serious argument in its favor. Ronald Knox, you may know of him, in his trials of a translator, he produced his own translation of the Vulgate into English mid-century, uh, in the 20th century. He held up for special disapprobation the following verse from Mark. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. Knox complains that this is typical King James. The translators are working only with the words and not with the sentence. They're just following the words. It gives you an English sentence, he says, which would get any man the sack, and rightly, from Fleet Street. Well, what's not to like about that, I hear you say. <laughs> this Mark quotation is certainly translation ease, but perhaps not so strange in the 17th century. Here's an excerpt from the diary of Samuel Pepys for 1st January 1662. Waking this morning out of my sleep on a sudden, comma, I did with my elbow hit my wife a great blow over her face and nose, comma, which waked her with pain, comma, at which I was sorry, comma, and to sleep again. I think that refers to himself rather than his wife. This kind of speak was parodied by Dale Spender in a spoof diary that she created for uh, Pepys' young wife Elizabeth. The entry for 22nd December 1655 reads, This day I did with Eliza meet, though not to market we did go, for still no monies do I have, and greatly does this vex me. There's a trochaic sort of meter kicking in there at the very end. And then there's memorability. I'm going to have to stop this lecture um, without getting on to uh, some that I uh, wanted to talk about the uh, 
modern translations and some aspects of them, but you've had enough to digest, I'm sure. Fifthly, then, memorability. The King James uh, can be memorized more easily than its unmelodious competitors. That's a particularly weak point. There are many texts in modern translations, especially those that follow in the Tyndale King James tradition, that differ hardly at all from the King James. They leave out the ests and the ths, but does that make them less memorable? Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image or humanity in our image. Matthew 11.28, you should be able to spot these, especially if you're students, you should be fired if you can't. John 1 and 29, John 14, verse 6, and so on. They sound perfectly familiar in the Revised Version, Revised Standard Version, uh, New Revised Standard Version, ESV, and even, to some extent, in NIV. Memorability is affected however, by more than the run of the text. The complainants about modern versions being unmemorable are usually past the peak of their own memorizing ability. The King James would be at least as challenging for them nowadays. It's, this is the kind of roses don't smell as they used to argument, isn't it? Maybe true. But uh, it's not only cross-breeding that is affected. My sense of smell is not quite what it used to be. And I remember a happy time. I can think back to County Antrim and a particular road and flowers. I can remember a time in my childhood when my nose was even closer to the flowers. And one way and another, you are able, perhaps when you're younger, to memorize. And so it's not just a question of the quality of the text. Unmemorability may even have its positive side. Does it not happen, are you not familiar with this, that the author of Scripture often has to listen to recitations of Bible verses in prayer addressed to him? You know, you're addressing in an I-thou situation, you're addressing personality and personhood in the ultimate and you stand there praising God and thanking him, suddenly you launch into two verses from Psalm 69 as if he's just an onlooker. You know that kind of thing? Uh, I, I, I always these days go back to Fiddler on the Roof and Tevye there, uh, the milkman. Uh, if you don't know Fiddler on the Roof, you should get that musical, Jewish musical. It will give you insight into Jewish mind in Bible times as well as 19th century and 20th century. Tevye had a habit of inventing Bible quotations, which he prefaced with, as the good book says. Not quite uh, a stitch in time saves nine, but he would have been capable of that. One day, in a moment of insight or honesty, he looks towards the heavens and he exclaims, why should I tell you what the good book says? Indeed. Acts 4 has a quote in a prayer, but there's good reason for it there, so don't throw that one at me. Our divine addressees were on the editorial committee and they don't need us quoting King James or anybody else. So, unmemorability actually has a small advantage attached to it. We might just learn enough to help ourselves and to be useful, but not to go proclaiming and declaiming in the presence of Almighty God. And prayer is certainly not for practicing memory verses. I don't have time to look, it's a pity, but uh, you have been very patient, or at least you look as if you have. And I don't have time to look at the modern trio of uh, translations, NIV, ESV, and the New King James Version. All I'll say by way of conclusion is that these translations are certainly meritorious, and uh, vie with the King James and are deserving of our acceptance. They are up against exactly the same things as happened down the centuries. The rejection of any new move to communicate the Word of God, even if it's more clearly, even if it's more accurately. Um, and so as we look at the translation industry of the past century, especially the differences in rendering of texts, the stylistic variations, and all that kind of thing, we might lose faith. We might even lose hope. 
But it's the very enduring power of the scriptures that makes all these projects defensible and the results beneficial. All seminal works attract translators. Recently, in our own fair town, an adherent of another religion, uh, when approached uh, and offered uh, a, a gospel, retorted that the Bible had been translated 40 times into English, as if that meant it was poor stuff. Uh, it's rather more than 40, isn't it? And if he had done a little bit of Googling, he could have discovered with a few keystrokes that his own holy book has been translated at least 60 times into English. That's what happens to works of importance. And that's why today there is this industry still of uh, bringing the word of God in all its richness to us. Um, Two fundamental truths about Scripture then, perhaps uh, one I haven't been able to deal with tonight, but that's the fixity of Scripture forever in heaven. What we have concentrated on tonight is the richness and multiple resonances of its inscripturation here on earth as the living, powerful, sharp-edged Word of God I was thinking just before coming here of the analogy of the molten lava and all the activity, subcutaneous, whatever you would call it, going on in the Bible as Bible texts are uh, redeployed, uh, redirected, and there is that literary activity going on in the formulation of God's truth, in the declaration of it, and in the illustration of the vividness of life lived under God. God, thank you very much indeed, and apologies for not quite making it to where I had hoped to tonight, perhaps you too had hoped to. I didn't get talking about ancient translations, and uh, there was one in particular I was going to mention just as a fairly harmless, uh, uncontroversial illustration. In Chronicles, there are quite a few references to uh, musical instruments. A translator into Syriac, and I've been working on this within living memory, didn't like musical instruments. So what did he do? Occasionally he left out one or two. Occasionally he passed over the jolly lot. And one occasion where it says in its first Chronicles 16, I believe, uh, where it mentions a list of instruments used in worship, he says, and did not use instruments of worship, but worship God with a pure heart and tongue. It's pure Milton in Paradise Lost, if you recall what he said about the unaccompanied praise of Eden that didn't need instruments. But there you are. Uh, I, I just commend to all such people Revelation chapter 15, verse 2, and ask whether it's worth the candle trying to prove that sort of thing. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>